Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the CDC Dental Public Health Lecture Series. I am Dr. Lorena Espinosa, the Associate Director for Science and a Senior Dental Officer. I am filling in today for Dr. Gina Thornton-Evans, the CDC Dental Public Health Residency Director. This lecture series is designed to help current and future dental public health residents gain a better understanding of the, den the 10 dental public health competencies and of current topics in the field. These webinars are for current dental public health residents, prospective residents, and anyone interested in the field of dental public health. Feel free to type your questions into the chat box and we will answer them during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. Today is, today is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Raul Garcia. Dr. Raul Garcia is professor and chair at the Department of Health Policy and Health Services Research at the Boston University Henry M. Goldman School of Dental Medicine. He's also the director of the Center for Research to Evaluate and Eliminate Dental Disparities. In addition, he is a director of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs Dental Longitudinal Study. At the national level, Dr. Garcia has served as president of the Hispanic Dental Association. He is also past president of the American Association for Dental Research. Currently, he is a member of the National Advisory Dental and Cranial Facial Research Council of the National Institute of Health. At the local level, he has served as chair and current member of the Massachusetts Oral Health Advocacy Task Force and as president of Healthcare for All Incorporated. Dr. Garcia is a 1981 graduate of the Harvard School of Dental Medicine, where he received the DMD degree in summa cum laude. Welcome, Dr. Garcia. Thank you very much for having me and the invitation to uh, present. Can you all see the, uh, the first slide, okay? Not just Actually, yet. No. Anything, no? Not good? I'm still not seeing it. There we go. Now it's coming up. Thank you for that. <laughs> Perfect, go ahead. Uh, Thank you to uh, Dr. Thornton Evans in absentia and her colleagues for inviting me to present today on the topic of race, racism, and oral health in America. Very broad topic, and I'll try to uh, be as efficient as I can in covering uh, the many issues involved. I have no disclosures in regards to the competitive of interest to report, and let me go over the learning objectives briefly. I'm targeting my talk to those who are current dental public health residents, those in training, and those who are uh, early in the stage in their career development um, to give them an idea of um, what they should be thinking about perhaps and what they should be ex exploring as far as um, areas of research, areas of um, opportunity in education and areas of opportunity in dental public health practice in regards to the issue of racism and oral health. One of our goals today is to have you understand the development of how race and ethnicity categories were developed and used in the analysis of population data in the US <clears throat> to understand ways to measure the impact of racism on oral health and well being, and also understand the role of racism on the persistence of oral health inequities in the US. Uh, an unstated learning objective, and it's really one that you will need to take, um, take up on your own in a sense after the talk, is for you to understand what we can and should be doing about it. In today's agenda, I'll try to sort of reframe some of the thinking about certain terminology. And so I'll spend some time defining terms. I'll have a lot of very text rich slides and I apologize for that, but I will want to at least be clear in some of the terms that uh, I'm gonna be using. 
I'll review evidence, but not in great depth or detail, but instead rather what I will use is the slides and the information on them to direct you for the more detailed original sources of items that I will be touching upon. So after the uh, webinar, please feel free to email me and I will be very glad to provide uh, a full PDF file of all my slides that you can then use as a reference source, so to speak, to take uh, some leads from my slides in pursuing uh, areas of reading and your own uh, research interests. And last but not least, I'll try to go over uh, my own personal views on what sort of next steps we can all be thinking of taking in the area of racism and oral health in America. So to start off with some resources um, that I mentioned and also some acknowledgements, I first wanted to acknowledge uh, the American Institute of Dental Public Health, which is a uh, 501c3 not-for-profit that was uh, founded and uh, its current president is Dr. David Capelli, well-respected public health, dental public health expert, now at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And one of the signature uh, features of the AIDPH, and you can learn more about it by going online to AIDPH.org, is its annual colloquia that tries to bring um, individuals together over a two-day period uh, to focus on important issues related to oral health policy. I wanted to particularly mention a colloquium that was held just two years ago, right before COVID, um, where I had the privilege of hearing uh, Professor Derek Griffith speak on the topic of racism and health. Uh, professor Griffith at that time was at Vanderbilt, but uh, this last summer he became a professor and the founding co-director of Georgetown's University Racial Justice Institute. And in that uh, presentation that he gave, and then I was also privileged to be the moderator of a panel on which he served, um, the conversation about this topic of confronting inequity through oral health policy was further elaborated. The entire colloquium's proceedings are available online, and you can also see Professor Griffith's own presentation um, through that uh, AIDPH portal. So I recommend that strongly to you. Another great resource that I think is probably the, the first one that I would recommend uh, to a trainee or even someone young and early in their career is this uh, terrific uh, book that was co-edited by Professor Griffith, Racism, Science and Tools for the Public Health Professional. It was issued by the APHA Press just a couple of years ago. And I think it's a great resource, uh, a starting point perhaps, for those interested in delving into this interesting and complex field. The foreword to that volume uh, was written by Cameron Jones, uh, formerly at CDC uh, and also a past APHA president. And in it, she very importantly uh, describes racism as a system of structuring opportunity, and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks, what we call race, that unfairly disadvantages some individual communities while unfairly advantaging others. And I think it's that distinction between the unfairly disadvantaging some while also unfairly advantaging others that is key to understanding uh, what racism is and its impacts. And of course, to address racism will require not just valuing all individuals and populations equally, but also the need to recognize and rectify historical injustices and in turn providing resources according to need. You've, I'm sure all heard of Coates's book on race and racism in a sense. It's a very personal, deeply personal memoir that he presented between the world and me, but it's also a historically accurate and factual based uh, retelling of the story of race and racism in America and in turn how it has affected himself and his family. The important thing that one can learn, I think, from Coates's book is that race does not precede racism. That in fact, race is the child of racism in Coates's construction, not the father. That race is the creation by which to act and impose power on others. And as he says, race has never been a matter of genealogy and physiognomy so much as one of hierarchy, meaning power relationships. I can also recommend another book by uh, the sociologist at Duke, Eduardo Bonilla Silva, also recent past president of the American Sociological Association, where he really more deeply gets into uh, the issue of race and racism and gives it a very contemporary view, a very scholarly view. This book, Racism Without Racist, is now in its sixth edition. And then he directly, I think, addresses a very important issue, very contemporary issue of colorblindness and the idea of the existence of colorblind racism. He writes, colorblind racism is a post-civil rights era form of racism that has a suave, apparently non-racial character, but nonetheless is still about justifying 
the various social arrangements and practices that maintain white privilege. And of course, I can't be at BU and not mention uh, my BU colleague, uh, Professor Ibram Kendi, um, and his two recent books, How to Be an Anti-Racist, and then uh, what he turned a journal of, of be anti-racist, not really a how-to guide, but in a sense, a tool for reflecting, um, for developing ideas and plans and initiating one's own either action as a professional or as a, on a personal level. And uh, he is the founding director of the Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research. Turning to resources in our own area of oral health, I can also point out to one very nice single volume uh, co-edited by Henry Pradwell and Caswell Evidence uh, came out in 2019 titled Oral Health in America, as in the title of my talk. Um, and it talks about removing the stain of disparity. Another resource that I can point to in the area of oral health is an upcoming special issue of the Journal of Public Health Dentistry, which is being co-edited by Eleanor Fleming, a faculty at the University of Maryland Dental School, and Julie Reynolds, a faculty member at the University of Iowa Dental School. And this uh, special issue will be on anti-racism in dental public health, engaging society, education policy, and practice. And I think uh, later on in my talk, I'll, if I have time, I'll get into a little bit more about some of its contents. However, even though the anticipated publication is later in 2022, there are already, as each of the individual articles becomes uh, finalized and goes through uh, its proof stage, uh, several already appear uh, online in the journal's website. So I recommend that you check those out. Now, as to racism and race, well, like the proverbial elephant in the room that everyone seems to tread lightly around and is unwilling to recognize or even name, the topics of race and racism are similar, sometimes difficult to talk about. And one can imagine and reasonably accept that certain individuals who have been the victims of racism uh, may find it uncomfortable, may find it uh, re-traumatizing to delve into these topics and discuss them in great depth. You can also imagine that those who are effectively the perpetrators of racism um, clearly do not want to be uh, challenged um, on the existence even of racism and would be resistant and perhaps uh, retaliative in regards to bringing up the topics. And then of course, there are many individuals who simply feel that the issue does not matter to them um, because I'm not racist. And it's this uh, unwitting, number of individuals who believe that this is not an issue for them to take up that I think is in some ways perhaps more problematic than those who are actively perpetrating racism and directly benefiting from them. There are those that are indirectly benefiting from racism all the time. To the issue of colorblindness, I don't see race, I'm a good person. One translation is, I'm going to use my place of privilege to refute and deny the suffering of those who do not have white privilege, while at the same time erasing their personal and cultural history. So with that preface, let's get into some of the definitions of racism and race in that order. One of my favorite and an excellent and succinct definition of racism and race come from the work of Williams, where he states that racism is an organized system in which the dominant racial group based on ideology of inferiority categorizes and ranks people into social groups called races and uses its power to devalue, disempower, and differentially allocate societal resources and opportunities to groups defined as inferior. And in turn, race is primarily a social category based on nationality, ethnicity, phenotypic, or other markers of social difference, which captures the differential access to power and resources in society. So the key aspects are racism is an organized system. It may be practiced at the level of individuals, but the key thing is that are its structural features that are effectively related to hierarchy and power relationships that aim to devalue and disempower some to differentially allocate value resources and opportunities to others. Mara Jones in her foreword to that book I mentioned has another and very related and similar definition of racism. And again, a system of structure and opportunity based on values, it unfairly disadvantages certain individuals and communities while unfairly advantaging others. And if you want an official, let's say CDC definition, it's very similar to Professor Jones 
Again, racism is a system consisting of structural, structuring opportunity and policy and practices and norms that assigns and determines opportunity based on the way people look and it's unfairly advantages some and disadvantages others. Now turning to race. It is actually our US Office of Management and Budget, a branch of our, um, a division of our executive branch where the control of funds that are, out, that are appropriated by Congress are actually dispersed from. And the US Office of Management and Budget for a long time has been in the business of determining race and ethnic categories in order to appropriately uh, ensure that laws are being followed in regards to the allocation of certain resources that may be based on race ethnicity definitions. The US Office of Management and Budget defines race as they are race and ethnic categories are neither anthropologically or scientifically based. Rather, they represent a social political construction designed for collecting data on race and ethnicity of the broad population groups in the country. So they're perhaps a useful tool perhaps to collect information on categories of individuals, but there's nothing intrinsically um, real except what is imposed on those individuals that are categorized in some of those race and ethnicity categories. Um, and that's effectively a social and political construction. Let's go back to the US Census and see what it tells us. This is a wonderful resource that Professor Griffith introduced me to at that conference two years ago. It's available online through Pew Research. And it really relates the, uh, the story of the US Census. The first was done in 1790. At that point in time, US officials went to each US household and basically recorded the name of the head of the household and categorized individuals into certain categories. Here's a complete enumeration of all the states at the time in 1790, and the categories were free white males divided into two components, those 16 and over, and those under 16, free white females, all other free persons, and slaves. Well, the next slide I'll show has the historical timeline of the changes in the different race and ethnicity categories that the US Census has used from 1790 to the latest count in 2020. The key thing is that these category names have changed from one decade to another in reflection of current politics, science, and public attitudes. The names of African Americans have changed over the 200 plus years of the census. Mm -hmm. Importantly, through 1950, census takers commonly determined the race of the people they counted. People were assigned their race by US officials. However, from 1960 on, Americans could choose their own race and in 2000 could choose more than one category. You can see the variety of changes over time in regards to what the US Census has done. This may be hard to read, but you can see that at one point in time, Mexican-Americans were considered a race unto themselves in 1930. The categories have changed over time in what African-Americans have been called and labeled as, as I've mentioned, and there have been increases in the subcategories of American Indians to now also include Native Alaskans, Asians, starting with Chinese, then Japanese, and then other Asians. You can see the variety of changes that have happened from um, recent years due to immigration, the variety of uh, Hispanic categories that have been created. The other interesting thing to remember is that race in these categories are fluid. You can find that out for yourself if you like, just Google the phrase, how the blank became white. Um, and I suggest you use only European uh, nationalities and primarily Southern European and Eastern European nationalities, although not exclusively. And you can see how various individuals from various national origin groups have, uh, have changed in their racial categorization or how they're perceived by the larger society over decades. Sometimes one will question, should we stop counting by these categories of race and ethnicity given they're, they're fraught with issues in and of themselves. Well, this is an article from uh, next month's June 2020 APHA uh, monthly newspaper, The Nation's Health, that reports that the 2020 US Census undercount of minorities could worsen health disparities. And in fact, because census data are used to formulate policy, funding levels, congressional representation, and scientific research allocations, it is important that we still continue to actually count and categorize individuals by these somewhat artificial, but still important uh, race and ethnicity categories. 
How did these categories really maintain themselves and gain traction? Well, it wasn't accidental. Basically, scientifically, scientists like you and I were responsible in no small part for making these race and ethnicity categories mean something in regards to public policy. This is a great resource from Harvard University Libraries and their project on identifying slavery and racism in its own history. And it writes, since enslaved people were first brought to this country, promoters of anti-Black racism and white supremacy have co-opted the authority of science to justify racial inequality. A history of pseudoscientific methods, so-called proving white biological superiority, and flawed social studies were used to show inherent racial characteristics that still influence society today. And this is not just limited to anti-Black racism or African-Americans as a category. Similar approaches have been used to categorize and disempower and exploit American Indian populations from the beginning of colonialism in North America. Mexicans in the Southwest and Western states, after the incorporation of those areas by the United States from Mexico, similarly suffered the same kinds of exploitations and disempowerment. Immigrants from various Latino countries to this day have similarly faced those challenges. The Chinese and the Japanese who were brought to America as workers have similarly faced those kinds of challenges and the impacts of racism. And the scientists played a very important role. 19th century scientists like Harvard's Louis Agassiz were proponents of polygenism, which posited that human races were distinct species this theory was supported by, again, pseudoscientific methods, which supposedly proved that white people were biologically superior to blacks. Early statistical health data in the US was weaponized against black Americans in the late 1800s, used to claim that they were predisposed to disease and destined for extinction and sources of contagion. To close out this section on race and racism, let me, uh, just refer you to one article, a wonderful resources in the England Journal of Medicine from two years ago by Bailey, how structural racism works, racist policies as a root cause of US racial health inequities. Writes, all definitions make clear that racism is not simply the result of private prejudices held by individuals, but is also produced and reproduced by laws, rules and practices, sanctioned and even implemented by various levels of government and embedded in the economic system in cultural societal norms. Confronting racism therefore requires not only changing individual attitudes, but transforming and dismantling the policies and institutions that undergird the US racial hierarchy. Let's switch gears now to oral health in America. You've heard that title before in uh, Treadwell's and Evans's uh, book, well, this title of Oral Health in America gained traction 22 years ago with the report of the first ever U.S. Surgeon General's Report on Oral Health in America, issued by Surgeon General David Satcher at the time. Now, David Satcher was not the first Surgeon General to take on the issue of oral health or to have strong interest in oral health. In fact, many years before, from 82 to 89, we had a magnificent Surgeon General named C. Everett Koop, who was very fond of saying and known to assert that a person cannot be healthy without good oral health. David Satcher from 1998 to 2002 made a tremendous impact though, um, not just in oral health and how we frame oral health and oral health issues, but also more broadly in how we frame minority health and health disparities. Now, this conjunction of minority health and health disparities is, is an important one and has also critically important historical antecedents. In the US government, the Office of Minority Health was created um, in 1986, um, a long, long time, as actually one of the most important and significant outcomes of the landmark 1985 HHS Secretary's Task Force Report on Black and Minority Health. When Thatcher came in, one of his uh, signature programs that he initiated was an initiative to eliminate racial and ethnic disparities in health by the year 2010. Um, Clearly an ambitious goal, but you have to start somewhere and you have to aim high. That conjunction of disparities and minority health also was evident in the changes at the NIH. The National Center of Minority Health and Health Disparities was established 
in the year 2000 and eventually became an institute, the NIH Institute of the, of the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities in 2010, another wonderful product of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. One of the key findings of David Satcher's 2000 re report was that despite the overall improvements in average oral health in the US, profound disparities were found to remain. And those disparities remained in certain groups as defined by various characteristics, including race, ethnicity. And importantly, for some conditions and diseases, the magnitude of those differences of those disparities was found to be striking. So what are those disparities and what does health disparities mean? And let me again give you some definitions to guide you in your thinking. One is from the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors from the year 2006, where health disparities are described as differences in the incidence, prevalence, mortality, et cetera, of diseases and conditions. But importantly, it also notes that these disparities occur among groups who have persistently experienced historical trauma, social disadvantage, or discrimination. In 2010, the National Partnership for Action to End Health Disparities of the US DHHS said health disparities is a particular type of health difference that is closely linked with social and economic disadvantage. And they went on to frame health equity as the attainment of the highest level of health for all people, or in, in a sense, health equity being the inverse of health inequity and health disparities being a form of health inequities. So you can see that there are lots of different definitions of disparities and of health inequities and of health inequalities, but they all have a common thread behind them. Of course, my favorite definition of health disparities is an old one, oldie but goodie, from Margaret Whitehead at WHO. They are differences which are unnecessary and avoidable, but in addition are also considered unfair and unjust. And I think that really sort of hits the point. So going back to oral health in America, well, we had a report that came out just before um, the end of the prior administration in 2021 by then U.S. Surgeon General Jerome Adams. And right as he was leaving um, his office at that point in time, he issued a very important report on community health and economic prosperity. And that report clearly called out the role of racism. It acknowledged the influence of structural, cultural, and interpersonal racism and bias on health, wealth, and well being of Americans. And I mentioned um, Surgeon General Jerome Adams because, in fact, the recent iteration of the Oral Health in America report that just came out in 2021, this time issued by the National Institute of Health via the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, was actually commissioned several years earlier by Surgeon General Jerome Adams. And I invite you to uh, take a look at this listening session that is available online. The Surgeon General listening session in November of 2018, it was a two-day conference that was organized, convened by the CDC in collaboration with the Office of the Surgeon General, probably one of the best conferences that I've attended and kudos to the CDC for, for running it. And this was intended to be a report issued by the Surgeon General of the United States. Between one thing and another, and conversations for another time, the report came out um, in 2021, but in December, and titled Oral Health in America, Advances and Challenges, as originally intended, but not as a report of the Surgeon General, but rather as a report of the National Institutes of Health via the NIPCR. That should not in any way detract um, from the value of the report, its accuracy, nor hopefully detract from the impact of its findings and its recommendations. The current NIDCR director, Rena D'Souza, along with then um, NIH director, Francis Collins, and current Surgeon General Vivek Murthy have written widely on the topic of oral health in America and oral health for all in sort of promoting the findings of that report that I just mentioned. And this is one piece in the England Journal that I invite you to read and review, which clearly talks about the importance of oral health in the context of overall health, but also clearly points out the inequities in the system and calls out racism as well. Now, the report, Oral Health in America, Advances and Challenges, just recently issued, actually mentioned the word racism. 
If you go back to the 2000 report by Surgeon General Satcher, the word racism does not cannot be found in that report. In contrast, racism is called out several times in this most recent report. For example, describing the insidious effects of racism on health. Describing structural racism that has been built in along with unconscious bias into our social and healthcare systems. The recognition of systemic racism with an array of public services, systemic racism embedded in our social structures, systemic racism that may in turn shape healthcare in ways that result in the inequities that have been documented both in oral health and in access to care. So I decided to just uh, a half dozen of the citations of racism, there are actually 12 in all in the volume, including two citations of, of articles that included the word racism. But they are important ones because it is at least an issue that is being identified, being called out, and I believe now being framed appropriately for both scientific investigation as well as for incorporation into one's practice of public health. The special issue of Journal of Public Health that I mentioned to you has one of its articles online that I recommend that you uh, look at. It's open access by uh, Professor Luisa Borrell, uh, who's a distinguished professor at City University of New York, writing with David Williams from Harvard about racism and oral health equity in the US. It's a brief article, but I think it's an important one in that really she points out that racism can clearly affect access to oral health and decision-making by acting as a social determinant of health. And it's that framing of racism in the context of the social determinants of health that I think is an important contribution that will inform many people's thinking moving forward. Clearly, it's important to understand that the potential mechanisms through which racism can affect important social determinants of health that are essential to oral health equity. Her article outlines recommendations and proposes ways to envision interventions. So the addition or the incorporation of racism into the social determinants of health, and this is the most recent iteration from Health Week 2000, I think will greatly inform work in the area of oral health disparities, oral health inequalities, oral health inequities. Now let me just go over some examples of how to put some of these terms and some of these concepts together. And I will selectively use work that colleagues of mine at Boston University have done and have been doing, not because it's really the best work out there, but it's work that I'm more familiar with, but you can clearly uh, explore on your own what is gonna be out there that is worth your while uh, to follow up on and you perhaps use as models for your own work. We're all familiar with the simple one item global self-rating of oral health, uh, common item in NHANES, other uh, federal surveys. How would you describe the condition of your mouth and teeth? Excellent, very good, good, fair, poor, typical five, five point Likert scale response. Uh, the similar question is asked in different ways in other Anglophone countries. For example, how would you consider the condition of your teeth and mouth presently? I believe this may be a Canadian one. How would you rate your own dental health? I believe that may be from Australia, but again, the similar five point response scale. And let me just briefly use that uh, outcome variable of global self rating of health to show you one analysis that we did many, many years ago um, led by my colleague at the time, Thomas Dietrich, who is now a professor at the University of Birmingham in the UK. We looked at data from the 2003 National Survey of Children's Health. It was the first time that survey had been done and it had a very good set of uh, oral health items that were incorporated. This is a telephone, uh, random digital telephone survey of US households trying to identify households with children and the interviews were done with the children's uh, parents or legal guardians those who could provide the most information about their child or the child in their household's uh, health conditions. And what we found in that analysis was that there were uh, not unexpectedly racial ethnic differences in the ratings of poor or fair oral health in children. Only 6% of non-Hispanic white rated their children's oral health as poor or fair. Almost twice that many parents of African-American children rated their children's oral health as poor or fair. And over three times as many parents of Hispanics rated their children's oral health as poor or fair. 
those differences were, were dramatic and significant. Importantly, when the analyses were then done controlling for variables you would think would account uh, for these race ethnicity differences, they were adjusted for age, sex, caregiver, education, and family poverty level that I've already mentioned. Um, my Boston University colleague, um, Dr. Asta Single, has uh, explored uh, this relationship between perceived racial discrimination and um, race ethnicity in dental utilization and oral health care services. She used data from the uh, 2014 uh, BRFSS. That survey had uh, an optional module to look at the issue of reactions to race. There were four states that included that module and she had um, used data from all four of those states. She then examined the extent to which those who reported experiencing racial discrimination were more or less likely to visit a dentist and more or less likely to have tooth loss. And I refer you to her upcoming article um, for the details and her, for her findings. But briefly, um, the BRFSS has included two items on oral health for a long time. The 2014 survey that Dr. Single used uh, has these two items. Uh, one related to uh, dental care use, how long has it been since you last visited a dentist, and one item on sort of oral self-reported conditions related to how many of your permanent teeth have been removed because of tooth decay or gum disease. Now, in addition to those oral health items, the optional module related to reactions to race provides, I think, a very rich resource for potential um, questions to ask of these data. The questions in that module, which is optional, are as follow, how often do you think about your race? Within the past 12 months at work, do you feel you were treated worse than the same or better than people of other races? Seeking healthcare, experience physical symptoms as a result of how you were treated because of your race. Felt emotionally upset, angry, sad, or frustrated as a result of how you were treated because of your race. Psychosocial correlates of oral health and racism as a stressor have been explored in regards to those sorts of uh, relationships that I've just mentioned in regards to the more broad area of health and racism as a stressor. I can refer you to two articles from quite a number of years ago, over 20 years ago. Uh, more recently, however, investigators in the area of oral health have begun to explore over the last 20 years the same sorts of relationships and I can point you out to at least three recent articles that will provide you with additional information in regards to how the psychosocial correlates of oral health and racism can be explored and investigated. Let me now turn to something that uh, my Boston University colleague, Dr. Brenda Heaton has been involved with. Dr. Heaton is a faculty member in the dental school, a social professor in my department, but also is an associate professor of epidemiology at our School of Public Health. And over the past decade, uh, we have been collaborating with a fantastic study that's based at Boston University called the Black Women's Health Study. It was initiated by Rosenberg, Adams, Campbell, and Palmer uh, many years ago. It has taken a group of African-American women that uh, began in 1995, ages 21 to 69, median age 38, from across the United States, the, the women present were recruited from uh, Essence Magazine subscribers from various professional organizations that had membership of African-American women. And again, through a rolling process through friends and family of early enrollees. So it is not a nationally representative sample of African-American women in the US. In contrast, it actually is a group of individuals that are, tend to be more highly educated uh, than average and in turn more health conscious than medically and generally engaged than average. Nevertheless, it provides a rich resource for exploring some of these relationships. Uh, there are biennial male questionnaires. They have had extraordinary retention in the study over the decades. And we have made use of the collaboration to begin to explore some of these relationships in African-American women. The Black Women's Health Study has incorporated um, measures of experiences of racism since 1997, beginning with their first follow-up. The items that they've used were adaptations from uh, instruments developed by Williams and colleagues 
back in 1997, and the reference to Williams is at the bottom of the slide, which we'll have available to you. And the kinds of questions are, for example, experiences of everyday racism, asking individuals, you receive poorer service than other people in restaurants or stores. And the response options are here below. People act as if they think you are not intelligent. People act as if they are afraid of you. People act as if they think you are dishonest. People act as if they are better than you. There's also um, three items on lifetime experiences of racism relating to ever been treated unfairly due to race, whether on the job, in housing, and or by the police. Those items are being used by the Black Women's Health Study to understand uh, health outcomes of interest to them, uh, in particular, um, women's health um, issues in regards to breast cancer, cervical cancer, other kinds of cancers, and also in regards to cardiovascular disease. We ourselves, in our work, collaboration with them, have been exploring these uh, under the leads of Brenda Heaton, uh, doing the oral health part, and Yvette Kozier, who is an associate professor of epidemiology at the School of Public Health, and also the school that school's associate dean for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Yvette is also one of the lead investigators of the Black Women's Health Study. A number of years ago, um, we were able to have them include that simple uh, self, global self-rating of oral health. How would you rate the health of your teeth and gums? And then in 2014, my colleague, Dr. Brenda Heaton, developed in collaboration with the Black Women's Health Study, um, a oral health questionnaire containing 33 items covering domains of dental care needs, dental care utilization insurance, self-reports of periodontal and gingival health, oral health practices, the presence of removable and fixed appliances, dental fear and anxiety, and oral health related quality of life. We now have a rich battery of dental questions that we can begin to ask of the larger overall Black Women's Health Study, and we're pursuing that um, currently. We've already had two publications led by Dr. Heaton and Dr. Kozier on oral health in the Black Women's Health Study, and there are two other publications that are now in different stages of the submission and review process, one led by Dr. Kozier on perceived racism in relation to self-related oral health in the U.S. Black women using data from the study, and another led by Dr. Uh, Julia Bond, a PhD, Julie, Ms. Julia Bond, a PhD candidate working under Dr. Heaton on perceived experiences of racism linked to dental fear and anxiety among Black women, viewing dental fear and anxiety as the factor through which racism may act in regards to affecting women's overall overall oral, me, women's oral health, as well as their use of dental care services. You heard in, my, in the introduction that I also play a role in VA and working in VA as a dental investigator over many years, including uh, having served in the 1990s as a senior career development awardee of the VA Health Services and Research and Development Service. So I have some familiarity with the VA and it is a fantastic healthcare system that does a great good great deal of good for many individuals. The VA, for those of you not familiar with VA, is the largest single healthcare system in the United States. It has, more importantly, an integrated, fully integrated health information system that covers both dental and medical procedures. In addition, it has the ability to provide care without charge to eligible veterans. Now, of the 9 million or more veterans enrolled in VA, healthcare programs, meaning medical care, only a small proportion are actually eligible for dental benefits. And that's due to a variety of VA criteria for eligibility for dental benefits in the larger system. But nevertheless, there are approximately half a million uh, veterans who are eligible for VA dental care. So it, it can serve as a rich resource for understanding at least dental care utilization as it relates to race ethnicity differences in a system of care where there are um, vast data resources in regards to medical and dental conditions, other uh, covariates of interest in regards to understanding differential use of care, but more importantly in a system of care where cost is no object, where the care that individuals receive is completely free of charge to them. So let me give you a couple of examples of work that my view colleagues have done using uh, data from the VA. And it was to study racial disparities in dental procedures. Again, sorry for the very rich slide. But back in 2003, my colleagues at BU 
um, led by Dr. Nancy Crescent, professor of medicine at BU, and uh, Dr. Judith Jones, at that time chair of general dentistry at the dental school, now at University of Detroit Mercy, looked to see whether there, very, there were variations in dental procedures based on race ethnicity uh, in regards to the distinction between root canal therapy versus tooth extraction. Um, they examined whether individuals who had uh, one or the other um, differed in regards to uh, their racial characteristics. The analyses were adjusted um, in great detail, um, and the details of the variables used in the analysis were given here. But most importantly, the bottom line was that it seemed that Black patients were significantly less likely overall to receive root canal therapy than whites, whereas Asian patients were more likely. Again, all else being equal to the extent that you can control for that. Clearly, the observed substantial racial variation in the provision of root canal therapy among patients treated in VA dental clinics was of concern. And one of the distinctions made, the uh, recommendation was that future research should identify the causes of such variations. And you can imagine what some of the causes could be. At least in two main categories, one could be patient preferences. An individual who has uh, a dental condition that could either uh, be routed to root canal therapy and restoration uh, may prefer that route as opposed to um, being routed to tooth extraction with a subsequent replacement of some sort. So clearly patient preferences must play or potentially must play some important role in this variation. Then again, there also clearly must be differences in the way providers uh, make recommendations, in the way providers choose perhaps to recommend differentially certain procedures to certain sorts of people and different procedures to others, or in the manner in which providers make those recommendations. So there can be patient-based preferences and provider-based factors related to the recommendations being made. And clearly those are questions that are very amenable to research and clearly amenable to research in a system of care like the VA. My colleagues um, at BU uh, revisited this topic um, over a dozen years later in 2016, this time using 2011 um, dental care utilization data from VA as opposed to the prior paper that used 1998 dental care utilization data. And they again, in 2016, when they published examining those 2011 data, did the same thing. They focused on the differential receipt of root canal therapy versus tooth extraction based on race ethnicity. And sure enough, after adjustment for known confounding factors, and you can see many of them listed here, black patients went, had the lowest root canal treatment rates. Now, VA itself had changed uh, for the better uh, in many ways over that time. They had incorporated a value of equity uh, as a means to improve uh, care and care outcomes in VA and the equitable distribution of resources. One of the conclusions of the paper was that current quality improvement efforts and a value to improve the equity of care in VA are not sufficient to address these racial and ethnic disparities in VA dental care, at least as far as in regards to the differential uh, options of root canal therapy versus tooth extraction. The authors further go, more targeted efforts will be needed to achieve equity for all. Now, this difference between root canal therapy and versus tooth extraction is actually a pretty straightforward one to investigate. And I checked in with my colleagues, uh, Nancy Cresson and Judy Jones, just this past week to ask them whether they uh, themselves or their colleagues or anyone they knew had really pursued this issue um, in VA in regards to research. And to the best of their knowledge, uh, they had not done anything, nor did they know of anyone else working in that area, but it may well be that VA is working on this issue uh, to this day. But nevertheless, it can be reasonably easily tested at least on the part of the providers. Um, here's an example of one way to test such uh, provider-based recommendation and how they may differ. Uh, this is a, a nice, simple, randomized clinical trial. It is from a, a population group in, um, of dentists in Sardinia, um, it, the uh, Mediterranean island uh, west of Italy, where 57 dentists uh, were presented with documentation from a simulated case of irreversible pulpitis for which root canal treatment would be a valid treatment option. And you can see the radiographs that were presented, um, images of uh, the mouth conditions and th the tooth decay, and uh, the two types of patients, one white, one black. 
The work was published uh, just recently, two years ago, in Journal of Dental Research, Clinical Translational Research, and has been well cited by many individuals. Bottom line, endodontic treatment recommendations were greater for the white versus the black patient. Moreover, black patients recommended tooth extraction were also less likely to be offered option of extraction followed by orthodontics. Now, this kind of uh, research approach, this kind of uh, simple uh, mock clinical case presentation, uh, randomized, um, can be done um, in different settings and may not be a bad way uh, to explore uh, the issues of differential provider recommendations based on race ethnicity of patients. Let's talk a little bit about next steps. And really that's for you all to decide amongst yourselves and decide collectively what is the best way to, um, to move forward. I can recommend again, some resources, at least in the oral health space. Um, an excellent uh, health affairs forefront piece uh, just appeared uh, last month um, on oral health equity cannot be achieved without racial equality, without racial equity. I recommend this to you, it's available online. Again, I'll recap that issue of Journal of Public Health Dentistry that I mentioned earlier and show you the kinds of articles and the, the topics that are being covered just to give you a flavor of um, this is not an issue you want to miss at all. It's gonna be, I think, a highly impactful uh, publication. More broadly, um, in regards to research in the area of racism and health, I just wanna point out a couple of things. One is the NIH. This is uh, from Francis Collins, the then NIH director, writing um, basically a very clear and direct letter of apology. To those individuals in biomedical research enterprise who have endured disadvantages due to structural racism, I am truly sorry. And you can read on for more of what he says. And in regards systemically, as an organization, uh, there is movement and uh, I think sincere support at multiple levels of the Institute of the NIH uh, to end structural racism to the extent that they can. And they clearly recognize that they are in a position to influence and contribute to positive, visible, and sustainable change to break the cycle of institutional racism. Even though Francis Collins is no longer the NIH director, I think we have an outstanding acting NIH director in Dr. Larry Tabak a dentist, someone who was previously an IDCR director, who just last Wednesday at our council meeting of NIDCR uh, gave a presentation um, on what NIH was doing just in this area. And I'm 100% convinced that um, there's sincerity there and that there is hope and possibility for change over the next several years and that we should all take advantage of these opportunities that are presenting themselves to us. I'll also mention uh, another resource of interest, uh, the Oral Health Interest Group of Academy Health last year, available online as a resource, was a, a session that they held uh, with multiple authors at the uh, 2021 Academy Health meeting, trying to acknowledge racism in oral health research and find ways forward. I also direct you to uh, the Oral Health Interest Group itself, whose current chair is Marco Vujicic from the ADA Health Policy Institute, and its co-vice chairs are Jacqueline Burgett from Pittsburgh and Lisa Simon. Uh, from Harvard. In the dental research world, the AADOCR um, and its International Associate of Dental Research um, Group, through its Behavioral and Epidemiologic and Health Services Research um, Group, led by Dr. Dan McNeil of West Virginia University, recently issued a consensus statement on the future directions for the behavioral and social sciences and oral health. Importantly, they point the way forward about how to incorporate um, behavioral social science and understanding and addressing health inequities. Surprisingly, nowhere in their article was the word racism mentioned once. The article uh, by McNeil was paired by an invited uh, perspective in JDR, which was led by Sarah Raskin and Eleanor Fleming and Raskin and Fleming point out that oral health equity and the consensus statement that was issued must address oppression, and it did not. They write, the consensus statement explicates global oral health equity as a foundational concern for our field. Given this context, a key concern is missing from the statement, oppression. The statement also perpetuates a conceptual and methodological error naming race as a social determinant rather than the more valid construct of racism. 
So the conversations are continuing. And I think it's important to have voices um, such as those of Raskin and Fleming who raise these issues uh, in forthright and important ways. More broadly, there's a growing sense that racism is a public health crisis. And in Sandro Galea's construction of what public health crisis means, which is the problem must, be, must affect large numbers of people, it must threaten health over the long term, it must require the adoption of large scale solutions. Well, unquestionably, racism is a problem that fits that definition. And in fact, the declarations that racism is a public health crisis are efforts that are being led nationally to locally. It involves institutions, organizations, government agencies, and communities of different sorts. There are resolutions being passed by various communities, and I can direct you to one, which I find is probably the, perhaps the best written one that I've seen so far, much better than the one written by the city of Cambridge in Massachusetts, where I live, uh, which is in Franklin County, Ohio. Uh, the C Franklin County Commissioner's Declaration of Racism as Public Health Crisis. Fantastic document. But as well, national organizations have basically signed on. The American Public Health Association was one of the leaders in this. Racism is an ongoing public health crisis that needs our attention now. The CDC itself has stated racism is a serious threat to the public's health. The American Medical Association, despite its many challenges over many years, has also recognized clearly that racism is a public health threat. What about our own community of, of dental research, dental education, dental practice, public health practice? The ADOCR, of which I'm a proud past president, of several years ago developed a diversity and inclusion statement, and you can see it online readily. However, the rest of the slide is blank purposely because um, there has not been, I think, a commensurate activity in the AADOCR uh, in the area of confronting racism uh, directly as perhaps uh, merits. So is it time for a systematic institutional self-examination among our various national dental organizations? Well, I think so, without doubt. Now, the American Medical Association many years ago, in 20, well, not that many, in 2008, apologized for its past discrimination against minority physicians. It said the group did not take a stand against discrimination by state medical societies, including the exclusion of African Americans until the 1960s. And in turn, more recently, the AMA has in fact, as I've noted, um, attested that racism is in fact a threat to public health. So progress has been made in that area. What about the American Dental Association? Well, a number of years ago, it similarly um, apologized for um, its role in tolerating discrimination. And basically it was a move that was made by its then president, uh, Dr. Raymond Gist, who was the ADA's first African-American president in October, 2010. He really claimed that Dennis, the Dennis Group should have done a better job in making sure minorities could join their affiliated state and local organizations before the mid 1960s. And he wrote, the ADA apologizes to dentists for not strongly enforcing non-discriminatory membership practices prior to 1965. I have not yet seen anything from the ADA uh, beyond this in regards to their role in perpetuating racism and racial disparities in the US related to oral health. And certainly nothing declaring racism to be a public health crisis uh, from the part of the American Dental Association. So uh, work needs to be done there. Now, if you want, uh, from my point of view, an example of one association in our oral health dental space that uh, has done, at least in text, a good job in confronting uh, the issue is the American Dental Hygienist Association, who in 2022 was celebrating its 100th year of existence as a profession and an association. And they clearly uh, understood that they could not celebrate their centennial without reflecting on and reckoning with the wrongdoing and harm that was caused. And they issued a very um, sincere and uh, I believe sincerely held, deeply held uh, apology. The question now is uh, moving forward, what will be done to rectify these prior wrongs? 
In medical education, the Association of American Medical Colleges, AAMC, which is medicine's equivalent of our IDEA, or American Dental Education Association, um, last year um, renamed one of their top awards, renamed um, their Flexner Award, named after Abraham Flexner, um, because of Dr. Flexner's views on race and racism. The Flexner Report of 1910 was transformative in American medicine at the time, and to this day has had an impact on the nature and the process of medical education. Its report basically eliminated proprietary schools of medicine and basically established in the US the biomedical model, model of medical education as the gold standard of medical training, the incorporation of science and organized clinical experience wedded together to train physicians in the context of university-based schools of medicine. And that report had great impacts, but in addition, while historically Abraham Flexner has been associated with rigor in academic medicine, in fact, his report recommended valuable changes, but those valuable changes had some negative impacts. That report also contained sexist and racist ideas, and his work directly contributed to the closure of five out of seven at the time historically black medical schools in the US at the beginning of the last century. That action negatively affected the training of black and African-American physicians for decades, and in turn adversely affected, negatively impacted the health of the black and African-American communities in the United States. So the WMC has stricken Abraham Fletcher's name from its roles, from its awards, and has basically described uh, his complicity effectively in uh, the wrongs that were caused to individuals due to racism. What about our own uh, AAMC equivalent, the American Knowledge Education Association? Well, I think they're doing pretty well in some ways. Uh, IDEA has issued a policy statement on the prevention and elimination of racism, harassment, discrimination, and bias in knowledge education that I invite you to read. Um, more importantly, I think they are addressing this issue as directly as they can. Uh, the September issue of the Journal of Dental Education will be dedicated entirely to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in dental education, being led by Sonia Smith, ADA Senior Vice President for Access, Diversity, and Inclusion, and faculty at Michigan, and Michael Reddy, who is the JD um, editor as well as dean at UCSF Dental School. And that will be followed by a workshop in October of 2022, ADA workshop, Impact 2030, Building a Culture of Inclusivity, and that JD special issue will guide the thinking behind that conference. So progress on the part of IDEA in this area. And let's turn to our own uh, William J. Guise, who is a father figure, so to speak, in, in, in dental education and dental research, dental science, uh, perhaps the Abraham Flexner of, of dentistry in many ways. William J. Guys was a biochemist professor at Columbia University who had extraordinarily strong interest in oral health and dental education and dentistry as a profession. He founded in 1919 the Journal of Dental Research. In 2020, he founded the International Association for Dental Research. In 1923, he was a founder of the American Association of Dental Schools, the then name of IDEA. And in 1926, he was the editor of a report that was commissioned to be very much like the Flexner Report of 16 years earlier, to look at dental education in the United States and Canada. Uh, because similarly to medicine, uh, two decades earlier, dental education at that time was also rife with proprietary schools, uh, the disconnect between the teaching of dentistry and dental science and the practice of dentistry, dental education that was taking place in um, not in university settings, not hospital based on medical school related settings. And in turn, his report was a landmark in dental education and dental practice and set the stage for the subsequent century. Now, part of his report in 1926 included uh, commentary and a chapter by him on the role of uh, dental care for African-Americans and dental schools for African-Americans. And I invite you to read that section of his, of his report carefully and come to your own conclusions as to whether there should be similar re-examination of the esteem which we hold William J. Guys. Finally, in closing, some personal comments. 
and thank you for your attention. So in a few minutes, let me give you my own uh, advice. And again, uh, taking advice from an old man, I know is unsolicited, but nevertheless, I would say it's an old man's prerogative to give advice. First, know history. And I don't mean N-O, no history. Although there are many in this country presently who seem to wish to deny uh, history and seem to wish to prevent history from even being discussed or taught in various settings. But I think it's important for all of us to know history uh, in order to move forward. So explore it carefully. And perhaps some of the reading suggestions that I've, I've given you in, in my talk uh, may, may help provide a starting point uh, for you in that regard. Always question authority, both scientific authority, professional authority. Be cautious, be judicious, but please question authority. Don't ever let anyone tell you, be patient. The issues we are confronting have taken a hundred or more years to occur and play out. So I would advise you, be impatient. And when someone makes that argument to you about uh, these issues that have taken a long time um, to happen, or they started a long time ago, I think one answer should be, well, it's about time that we started doing something about it. We have lots of wasted, lost time to make up. So please be impatient. And of course, persevere. Your work as dental public health professionals, as scientists, as educators, as practitioners of dental public health um, will have many challenges. And if you're gonna be working in the space of racism and oral health, which you have to, if you're gonna be a successful public health practitioner and achieve the goals we all wanna achieve, you need to persevere. So thank you very much for your attention. I'd be glad to entertain questions. Thank you, Dr. Garcia, for a very interesting and important presentation. We will now open it up for questions. To ask a question, please type your question into the Q&A box. And we have one question that, um, and I'll read it to you, Dr. Garcia. Could you please comment on the low percentages of dentists that accept patients on Medicaid, as well as the ADA opposition of including dental care in Medicare, whether this may be a reflection of racism and what can be done about it? That's a great uh, question. So I'll, I'll take it in, 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 in two parts. Let's just talk about Medicaid first. Um, that's a great question. And it, it's amenable to scientific exploration without question. That's, that's clearly an explorable, testable hypothesis in many ways. Um, it's clear that dentists have financial stakes at play in regards to their willingness or not to accept Medicaid as a form of payment for their services. There are clearly issues that dentists complain about in regards to the so-called administrative burdens of dealing with a governmental um, insurance program, and those are real. Nevertheless, it seems that in those situations where there have been in fact increases in the dental reimbursement rates uh, to encourage more and more dentists to take part, when there have been improvements in the administrative uh, processes that dentists have to undergo, uh, still there seems to have been uh, less than expected uptake of enrollment by dentists in various Medicaid programs. So clearly there's a financial incentive that dentists have as effectively being small businessmen, businesswomen, but by the same token, one has to wonder uh, as to what is really going on in their thinking. I can't guess what's in their minds, um, but just see what's on the surface and clearly there has been um, a selective um, disenfranchisement of certain communities from their ability to access dental care services. Now turning towards uh, Medicare, um, clearly uh, the ADA was supportive of a certain kind of dental care services in Medicare, uh, one that was effectively an option or one that was effectively targeting those who were of lower incomes, meaning having uh, an expansion of Medicaid effectively to cover adults who were 65 and over. Neither of those uh, proposals that the ADA uh, backed at different times really had much traction, uh, nor was expected to have much traction. And again, my own interpretation of the ADA's resistance overall to the expansion of Medicare to include dental benefits, again, relates to uh, financial reasons 
um, and the financial well-being of the organization and, and its members, um, I think is driving a lot of that conversation. The extent to which racism is part of that equation, again, I don't know, but again, it's worth exploring. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have the next question. Do you see the underfunding of public dental programs as a symptom of racism? Um, you could construe it that way as, a, as an outcome of racism. Um, by the same token, um, there are lots of poor people um, that are white. And it's interesting to me to see the extent to which um, poor people are, as a class, discriminated against heavily. And then even within class, then those that are non-white even more so. But the resistance, I think, is not necessarily one that um, needs to be addressed directly, because I do think that if there's simply a desire to provide health and healthcare benefits to all, fairly and equitably, then all will have at least the, the access financially to get those services. More importantly to me, the concern is the actual location of and funding of facilities such as community health centers, FQHCs in areas. There clearly is an underfunding and historically disproportionate uh, uh, underfunding and lack of localization of those kinds of services in minority, so-called minority communities. So yes, there is a role clearly that has been played by racism. Next question. What public policy could be implemented to reduce racial disparities in oral health? Wow, that's, um, that's a good question, but one that is uh, well beyond the scope of a, of a glib few minutes answer. I would say the answer is gonna come from you all, the community out there that is part of this webinar, the, the individuals that I've mentioned as, as leaders in this field, um, co-authors and conveners of different organizations and meetings, I think it's gonna be clearly a, a group effort. It's gonna have to come up um, with the kinds of policies that are gonna be workable and um, likely to be able to be implemented. Great, um, thank you. Next question is, what are your thoughts of using non-Hispanic whites as a reference standard in regards to understanding outcomes of non-Hispanic Blacks instead of using Black populations like the one you reference in the BWHS, um, highly educated, health conscious, et cetera, populations that might be more appropriate to compare Black outcomes as we already have overwhelming evidence that inequ inequities exist between races? I, if I understand the premise of the question, I, I, I agree. And I would say it's not a binary choice um, to use non-Hispanic whites as the reference point for all analyses or separately just look at particular groups within themselves. I think, I think there's, there's great value in doing both. Um, the issue of, of continuing to use non Hispanic whites as a reference point is I think something that we'll have to almost inadvertently continue to need to do to continue to serve as reference points to relate to past work, past accomplishments, uh, past methods that have been used to guide our work forward. I do think there needs to be work in both areas, um, working within particular racial ethnic minority groupings, categories, but even understanding the great diversity within those categories. Clearly, within the category of Latinos, there's extraordinary diversity um, based on geography, national origin, other factors. Within the African-American community in the U.S., again, there, there's vast diversity in, in regards to many characteristics, not just um, education and, and income and class. Um, and similarly, in, in other um, non-white um, communities. Thank you. Can you speak to the urgency of diversifying faculty and oral health workforce and how this impacts health outcome? Boy, urgency of that, it's like you could, you could scream and shout and bang a drum as much as you want. And it seems that um, it's really, really, really slow progress. Um, one of the challenges of, of diversifying the faculty in, 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 in a dental educational setting is that we're talking about, we're suffering the legacy of generations 
of oppression, generations of exclusion, generations of the effects of racism on the development of a non-white dental workforce and dental educator workforce. And so to, to catch up uh, at the pace that we need to catch up is overwhelming. But what I do see is insufficient progress um, in many institutions. Um, there are some institutions of higher education and dental education that have made progress, have made uh, very clear, strong, affirmative strides in doing this, but it really requires an extraordinary level of institutional leadership and institutional commitment. And I just don't see that uh, very broadly across uh, dental schools in the United States. And I do think that without that commensurate increase in the diversity of the dental professional workforce and the dental education workforce, progress will be slow overall in trying to achieve uh, racial health equity or health equity amongst all our uh, groups in the US. Thank you, next question. As we think this topic, as you frame the lecture, what do you see a concrete action that we all could take today or in the coming weeks, whether one is practicing or learning dental public health or practicing as a clinician? Understanding that um, the person who raises these issues um, may be in a differential power situation to those who control their well being, whether their educational progress, their employment, et cetera. Um, one has to be, I suppose, cautious in how one approaches the issue. But I would say the most important thing that everyone can do is to call out racism. When you see it, when you read it, when you feel it, when it exists, call it out. Now, how you call it out um, will vary depending on the setting and the religion that you have to the person in power, et cetera. But, but calling out racism, naming it, I think is essential and important in understanding it, it's key central role in explaining, understanding the differences in health outcomes amongst groups is essential. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Are there any other questions from the audience? The, our next question, do you believe that racism exists in our dental schools? If yes, how do we start the process of addressing racism in our dental schools? Uh, the answer is yes, I, I firmly believe it exists in our dental schools. I, um, from a personal level, um, I can speak from my own lived experience that it is real and it exists. Um, what one can do about it um, is, challenging. Um, and I, what I have learned in my 40 years in dental education um, is that leadership matters. All the grassroots efforts, all the grassroots organizing at the level of students or junior faculty, staff, coalitions, can only go so far if the person at top, whether the top guy or the top gal, that dental school dean, um, gets it or not, I think is essential. And of course, those top gals and guys, those dental school deans are put in place by others higher in the hierarchy, provost, VP for health affairs, university president, et cetera. And depends on what they're all about, what their priority is. So it's such a hierarchical system that it's hard even at the level of a uh, department chair or an individual faculty member to actually gain traction. Um, but I do believe at the level of the school itself, progress can be made if there's the right leader in place as a dean. And the key to get that leader is to, um, to challenge the ones that are in place now that are not doing what they need to do uh, and to ensure that uh, good people and right thinking people uh, take those leadership roles. Thank you. Next question. Earlier this week, I learned that an elderly family member experienced weight bias and dental malpractice early in her life that has led to an extreme distrust of healthcare providers. Are you aware of any efforts to rebuild trust with older generations of BIPOC Americans who might have had negative experiences with dentists and other healthcare providers? 
these individuals are often um, matriarchs and patriarchs and weird and wield a lot of power in the family? That, that is a great, great question. And it's not something that I have uh, knowledge of or experience in to be able to answer intelligently. I will say that the area of um, experiencing of racism and having it act or be mediated through dental fear and anxiety is a really important and interesting area of investigation. It's something that my colleague, Dr. Brenda Heaton, um, working with others, including Dan McNeil at, at WVU, um, is pursuing and trying to understand whether dental fear and anxiety is a, a, an area of intervention to be able to address some of these past uh, traumas that individuals have experienced um, that have translated in turn to uh, inability to utilize dental care services. So great question. Um, interesting topic that needs further investigation, but I do think it's amenable to research um, and study and eventual intervention. So thank you. What happens when you call it out and the leadership does not hear you? Oh, um, that is very, very common. Um, don't be surprised. Um, and uh, don't be surprised that if you just say it louder, say the same thing louder, um, it also is not heard. And if you say it even louder still, at some point um, there will be some resistance and potentially even retaliation. So at that point in time, it's just a matter of trying to build uh, enough support so it's not just an individual uh, doing the calling out. Um, and there is strength in numbers. So I think one needs to find that right critical mass in whatever work setting you are, whatever institution you're working in, to be able to uh, show that it's not one person's issue, but it is a group's issue. It is um, a larger issue than just an individual issue. And of course, if you're in a situation where you really feel this is not um, ever going to be heard or an issue that's going to be given its due respect, then unfortunately, um, one's only choice is to find other places to work. Now, that's easier said than done in and of itself. So um, my advice in that regard, is really not something I can uh, really support. So I'm sorry that my answer is not uh, as clear and as direct and as helpful as perhaps I wish it could be. But great question, thank you. How does a person identify racism, especially among well-educated people in 2022? It seems like it would be opaque and not directly stated. That's 100% that's correct and it's absolutely right. And it's a challenge to do it and to point it out to individuals. Um, there are many, uh, good writings on, on the topic. And uh, I can just point out some of the um, manifestations of it from the two cartoons that I mentioned earlier um, and uh, refer you to, uh, to Kendi's work in, in part to understand how to uh, address some of these um, examples. But clearly uh, those who say, well, I am not a racist um, is uh, not necessarily um, um, a convincing uh, statement made by people. People who say, I'm, well, I'm colorblind. I am blind to color. I, I don't see color. That by itself is clearly uh, a manifestation of, of, of a concern that uh, we should have um, in regards to that individual's beliefs. But um, I don't have an answer to that. I'm sorry, but I'll have to find uh, some resources to add to my subsequent talk to help guide people in this area. What advice would you give to current dental students who are interested in pursuing a dental public health residency? Um, I would say uh, look closely at the Centers for Disease Control um, as a great uh, place for potentially uh, pursuing that residency program. Uh, I understand that they recently received um, a great endorsement and increased uh, support uh, for their dental public health residency led by Dr. Gina Thornton Evans. It has a long and rich history of training some outstanding dental public health practitioners. Um, but that would be one place that I would say uh, turn to as a resource and there are other outstanding dental public health residency programs, including uh, my own at Boston University that is led by uh, Dr. Uh, Mary Tavares and, and many others uh, across the country. But uh, uh, for students interested in doing that, they should reach out to the American Association for Public Health Dentistry. There are student chapters at a number of dental schools of the AA PhD, but that would be the, uh, the other source nationally for students to turn to as a resource in uh, thinking about pursuing dental public health residency programs. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Um, for more information on the residency here, there's a link in the chat. Um, 
So that, so we're at time now. Um, we got lots and lots of very good questions. Um, and so let's see, can we, great, thank you. Please check the Dental Public Health Lecture Series webpage for important updates to our lecture series, including an introductory video that provides a brief overview of dental public health and the lecture series. Please contact us with any questions. The next webinar will be scheduled for September. And lastly, thank you for joining us. This concludes today's webinar. And thank you again, Dr. Garcia. Thank you.